Good morning to all of you. We're happy to have you here this morning on this beautiful June 11th Sunday morning. I want to ask Brother Ron if he would come to the uh, uh, church poster sign for us for a moment. We want to give God glory and praise him for great things he has done. And we have had additions to our roofing fund, which we're really excited about. And you keep in mind, we started this only back in April or back in February. So it relatively hasn't been a very long time at all. We have a goal of $18,000. And uh, last Sunday we had $4,500. I'll let Ron raise that up today. Then we give all give God a great big hand in just a moment. We have crossed two more $500 barriers, so we're up to $5,500, plus a little bit more. Let's give God a hand. <laughs> Thank you for your prayers and all you did in giving. And we'll ask Ron if he'll just open our service in prayer. And uh, this will be a prayer of thanksgiving as well as prayer for our nation and the other things. Brother Ron. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we come this morning to we are so thankful of the God that loves and cares for us. Lord, we're uh, come to know that how that you keep us, and take care of us, and everything's in your kind. Lord, we praise you for it. We thank you for our pastor. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to anoint him. We pray, Lord, for uh, people that come and uh, enjoy the word of God and uh, to learn about you and to know about you and Grow closer to you. Lord, we look to you now for this service. We ask, Lord, that you lead God and direct in the service and everything that's done here that you get honor and glory for. And Lord, we look to you now and ask you for our sick. Lord, you know the list is long. And we, each one needs a helping hand from God. Lord, we pray that you'd help them. We look to you for those that are lost, undone, deceived, Lord, that you'd help them to come and Lord, to open their eyes to see the truth in their hearts to receive Jesus. Lord, we need our country, Lord, to, you know, we need you to move upon the country and to move upon the leaders and help us, Lord, to return to you in the way that we once were, Lord, a nation that honored and glorified God in the world. Lord, we uh, ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Ron. Appreciate that. If you would open your bulletins for just a moment, uh, we have uh, watching usually our Facebook services that are being streamed live, missionaries that are in Africa, South Africa, Indonesia, India, and uh, the Philippines, at least that I know of right now. And they're always requesting that we pray for them. So we pray for all missionaries and those uh, four in particular. Now, one thing coming up this week is the Putt Putt Golf or Miniature Golf that'll be at Adventure Landing this Thursday at 5. If you'd like to come and play, or if you'd like to come and laugh at those who try to play, we'd love to have you come. And we'll try to go out after those kind of things to grab a hot dog or something afterwards at some local restaurant. So keep that in mind. And remember now, Father's Day Sunday, we want to honor all the fathers, but that Sunday night, uh, we have the Mercy's Well uh, trio that will be coming, and you can Google those. They're just a wonderful, wonderful group. They'll be here singing in concert Sunday night on Father's Day, and maybe I could twist Ron's arm and Donna's arm, and maybe we just order some pizza or something for that instead of these ladies cooking. They did such a good job yesterday. Ron and his, uh, is it your uncle? Wayne uh, did <coughs> the cooking of the fish and Billy Masters, they did the, uh, or Otis Masters, they did the hot dogs and fish. And I tell you, people <coughs> love that. The bluegrass group was just wonderful. And we had one of the largest attendance we've had since I've been here was over 75 people. And we did have some of our neighbors visiting us. Now what we need to do is pray. 
that God will bring uh, into this church those that we can minister to and also those that are looking for a church home that maybe have just moved into the area, into the community. So keep those things in mind in, in prayer. Now I wanted to, remit, to mention to you, Teresa Morgan is a friend of ours. She had surgery recently on her foot or both feet. And then we have Carolyn Masters and Angelina that we're praying for continual healing for them. Carolyn has run into some complications where she's gonna to have to have further things done to her wrist. And then we're praying for Linda and uh, Jimmy Bolin, for Brenda and Larry Shore. And uh, keep those folks in prayer continually. Then a young man named Warren Peeler, who uh, recently, uh, he's in need of a heart transplant. And then Patty Flippin uh, uh, texted me and said that her husband, I think they call him Bubba, is sick and uh, he is in need of prayer as well as other family members of her. And then Sister Janet had a little rough day yesterday. So Janet, we're gonna lift you up in prayer as well, okay? But we pray for all of these folks. So let's just quickly, again, Ron just pray. So let's join our hearts. You hear, hear those requests. Let's have a brief prayer, and then we'll have Dawson come and lead us in our morning worship number. Let us pray. Father, we continue Ron's prayer, and we lift up these now that we've mentioned, and we pray a special touch from you to their lives, whatever their need may be, whether it be healing, encouragement, strength. Father, we pray for them. We lift up our missionary friends around the world and pray that you bless their ministries and help them to be fruitful. We thank you and praise you for the wonderful, successful day we had yesterday and all the hard work of those who prepared the facilities and the food and uh, did clean up afterwards. We thank you for providing people like that. We ask now, Father, that you would bless this service as we enter into it this hour, in Christ's name I pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Dawson, would you please come? Good morning, will y'all please stand with me and turn to page 272. We're going to sing the style of rock. That's page 272. We're going to sing the first three verses only. <clears throat> Hey, Dawson, could I change that to the first, second, and fourth? First, second, fourth. First, second, and fourth. Okay, so <clears throat> Thank you. 
very good. That was awesome. You prayed for the office. Dear Lord, thank you, God, for waking us all up this morning, God. Just thank you for the sunshine this morning, God. Just please pray for this church and help it to grow. And just please pray for all the prayer requests that have been said this morning, God. And thank you for everything you've always done for us, God. In your name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh 
Thank you, Senator. You may remain seated on this one, but will you turn to page 354 and sing what a friend we have in Jesus? Let's sing all verses this morning. Page 354. <laughs>
and I know that the witness he witnessed of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John the Baptist, or of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom you have sent, for whom he has sent, him you believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God on I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my God? The beautiful Son of God. The beautiful Son of God. Who is our Lord Jesus Christ? He's the omnipotent Son of God. And he delights to love the loveless. He delights to heal the hurting. He delights to help the helpless. He manifests his mercy to all those who are willing to be helped, even those listening to my voice today. You may think that no one cares. You may think that no one hears your prayers, but God is very much aware. And if you're willing to believe upon him and open your heart and trust in him, then he is more than willing to help you. And in a miracle, we find that a miracle is that power of God that actually overrules any of the normal things that human beings are accustomed to. A miracle is something that can only be explained as it is that God did that particular act or function. So we witnessed in this passage of scripture, John chapter 5, the story of the amazing miracle of Jesus approaching the man at the pool of Bethsaida and heals him after he had been paralyzed for 38 years in that condition. He laid there at the pool for countless years and he had not been made well. And when Jesus comes and has compassion upon him and heals him, a great miracle is obvious to all. And people should have rejoiced and praised God for it. But what do the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the organized religion of Jesus do in his day? They hated him. Yep. They hated him. And the fire of their hatred was burning brighter and brighter and hotter and hotter. And one day it will actually explode in a volcanic uh, eruption of hatred towards Christ when they literally crucify and murder him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is that? If you go back and look at verse 18, it says that therefore the Jews sought the Lord to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath by healing the man on the Sabbath day, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, that was the one thing we mentioned last time that they were correct. He was equal with God and he did claim to be equal with God. So he had done two things. He had broken the Sabbath day by healing this man who had been laying by the pool for 38 years. And then he said things in his words that indicated that he was claiming to be the son of God. So I want you to picture a courtroom scene or back in their days, maybe a tribunal in which Christ himself now is being uh, accused by witnesses 
and those witnesses that were accusing him or those accusers were causing him or claiming that the things that he had done was worthy of absolute death, that he needed to be killed. So Christ, I believe in a sense, we could say in his own defense, begins to summon witnesses to uh, prove that those two things, or at least that one thing was absolutely true, that he is God. He is the Son of God. He is equal with God. And because of that, the Father worketh hitherto, so the Christ worketh. As God the Father has not stopped uh, taking care of us in the universe since he created it, Jesus Christ cannot help but do the things that uh, appeal to him or that call or, or that are yearning from him to do something for them, such as this poor, poor, impotent man. So Jesus, in verse 31 to 30, uh, 30 to 31, says this, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Well, what is he saying? In the eyes of the Jewish accusers there, they were basically just going to claim that he was a liar, that he was blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that he was making a claim that he could not support in any way. So him saying this, claiming to be the Son of God, was his own witness. And so therefore, that would not stand up in the Jewish court of law because they, uh, the law stated that there had to be at least two or more witnesses uh, if any claim was made to prove that that claim was true. So Christ knew that. He said, okay, in your eyes, my witness is not true. So in that case, I would like to call some additional witnesses to bear witness to the fact that I am the Son of God. So I want you to look at the first witness that he called. And that's verse 32. There is another that bears witness of me. You can put a little number one beside these as we go over them. It'll help you to remember that there are seven witnesses that Christ calls to bear witness of the claim that he is the son of God. So he says, there is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness that he witnessed of me is true. I believe personally that this is none other than the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. In every situation, in every time Christ is speaking, in every act that he is doing, the Holy Spirit is present. And when his words are being proclaimed in power and authority, when they are being spoken, whomever it may be, through the word of God, the Holy Spirit is thus verifying that these are the words of God. And the sinner, when he is listening to the words of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is pounding upon his heart, trying to bring conviction to that sinner's soul to bring him into a believing knowledge of the Son of God. Jesus would later teach in the Gospel of John that when I go away, let not your heart be troubled because I'm going to send another. Remember that? And he is none other than the Holy Spirit. He is the comforter who will be with you and shall be with you forever. And he will teach you all things whatsoever I have told you. So I believe the first witness that he calls is the Holy Spirit of God. And no matter whether I'm in preaching or counseling or talking or teaching, I always in my mind and in my heart acknowledge that there is another person in the room beside of me. And that is the Holy Spirit of God. And you want to make someone nervous. You get a husband and wife in counseling session before you, you. They're sitting in two chairs and you're sitting in another chair. And there's another chair there. I would say to them, you may have noticed there's a, another chair we have in this room. You know who's occupying that chair? It is the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that he knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're planning to tell me. So we need to be truthful and honest in our counseling session. All of a sudden, it takes on a different aura. All of a sudden, they sit up and they perk up and they want to tell the truth. So whether the Jews would acknowledge this or not, something had been knocking at their heart's door, and that was the Holy Spirit of God. Well, witness 2 in verse 33 through 35. Notice this. 
You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He, John the Baptist, was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So now the second witness is that of John the Baptist. Now, do you remember when John the Baptist came on the scene back in John 1.19? The Bible says, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? Well, John said, I am not the Christ. I am the one to bear witness of the Christ. As the prophets have proclaimed, this one that the prophets has proclaimed, have proclaimed is now present with us. And I am not worthy to stoop down and untie his, the laces of his shoe. This is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and you would do well to hear him. So John the Baptist bear witness of Jesus Christ. He was witness to the truth. And I love this part where it says here, he was a burning and shining light. And what that simply tells us is, now listen, if you turn the lights off in here, you know what the lights do? They illuminate the situation. They shine light on things. Light really has never been for its own glory, has it? It's never been to call attention to itself. We don't come in and say, oh, look at the light, look at the light, look at the light. When the light is on, we say, look at the sanctuary, look at the, the uh Facility, look at that handsome preacher up there. See, the light shines light on us. It illuminates us. It's not for its own glory. So when John the Baptist came on the scene as a bright and shining light, he was throwing light upon Jesus, the light of the world. That's the witness that Jesus said. And listen, he said, you were willing for a time to, to glory in the light of John. And what that meant was, originally, when they John was preaching, they were okay with that. When they sent these people to inquire of John, they didn't. John didn't uh, deny that Jesus was the Son of God. For had he done that, the Jews would have arrested Jesus then. But John uh, exalted Jesus Christ, and the Pharisees were somewhat quiet. They were perplexed. Maybe they were searching out, trying to find out if John was correct or just a loony tune out of the desert or wilderness somewhere. But what they did is they glorified in that light or they rested in that light of John for a season. You know what that means? There was a time when that season ended and then they turned against John and they turned against Jesus. So witness number three, verse 36. And notice what Jesus said. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works, here's your witness three, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness on me that the Father has sent me. Do you see that witness? That's loud and clear, isn't it? And what is he referring to when he says the works? We're talking about the miracles that John, the signs that John has already said, and we've studied this. There are other miracles that Jesus did which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. So the works that Jesus did, the miracles that Jesus did, gave testimony to the fact that it was only God who could do that. And we look at not only the miracles, because back then they had grown accustomed to the miracle stories of the Old Testament prophets and what God had done throughout the Old Testament history. But now here comes this one that the Bible had already said that those signs and wonders would authenticate that he was indeed the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And Jesus said, these very works that I do ought to be enough to, to let you know that I am the Christ. What's so good about his works? When well, you think about their number, Christ had not just done a measly little few miracles. He healed many people. He did many, many things. John said to which it, that if I were to write every wonderful thing he did, there's not enough books written, uh, in, not, not enough libraries to hold those books to contain the marvelous works that Jesus did. What a statement that is. So the vast number of miracles and works that Jesus did. And then what about their greatness? He wasn't talking about pretending to levitate a person in the air like some of these magicians do 
or those magical tricks like people do. He's talking about causing a withered hand to become whole. He's talking about causing a lame leg to be made whole. He's talking about having blinded eyes to be open and see and deaf ears to be able to hear. He is even talking about raising the dead. These miracles are great and awesome. And then their publicity. Think about this. Christ didn't do these things in a corner. He didn't do these things in a quiet way. Most of the time when you see Christ doing a miracle, he had people around him and he would say, don't say anything about this yet. But you know what? The word got out. His power spread near and far. So it wasn't a little thing that we hear about in Utah. Let's go see Mother Teresa's face in that pancake the Mexican uh, baked up that morning. It's not going out here to see uh, the lights that when the lights shine at a certain time, you see the face of Jesus in the, in the sky. It's not little things like that. These are things that multitudes of people saw them. In fact, the Pharisees could not discredit those miracles. And we think about the character of those miracles. They were mercy. They were love. They were compassionate. They were helpful. They were beneficial to men. Christ did not do this so he could collect a large offering in the Sunday morning service. Hey, we're having healing services this Tuesday. Come and bring all your sick folk and don't forget to bring your checkbook. He wasn't doing that so that he could gain from people. He was doing it so he could yield to people. That's the difference in the miracles that Christ did. And then what happened here, they would actually uh, appeal to the very senses of humanity in the fact that they would be visible. People could see them. They could hear them. They could touch them. They could see it before their eyes. I mean, when you talk about a person that has leprosy and they stink and all of a sudden they become like a beautiful baby, or you see a person who you know had a withered hand or a broken leg or a, a man like this impotent man that everyone knew was sick for 38 years. When you see that happen, what else can you do? But say, that has to be of God. Do you see how foolish these people have been? Let's look at the next witness. Witness uh, four is God himself, the Father. Look at verse 37. And it says here, and the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Do you see that? You have neither heard his voice or seen his shape. Does this remind you of when Christ was baptized? When Christ was baptized, there John is identifying him. <coughs> Behold, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And as he was being baptized, the shape of God came down <coughs> like what? Like a dove. <coughs> And Jesus said, you didn't hear his voice and you didn't see his shape. You're blind and you're deaf. All the things that God the Father has tried to do to say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You're not listening to him. You're not listening. Open that set of ears I gave you. Live with your eyes and you will hear the voice of God and you will see his shape. But they didn't do that. So the Father himself bore witness of Jesus Christ. The chapter of one of Hebrews says that God at sundry times and in divers manners used to speak to us by the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his Son who is the express image of the Father. Amen? Amen. Witness number five. Verse 39 through 44. I love this passage of scripture. And by the way, these are so vast and deep, we can only just touch on each of these. There are sermons galore on every one of these witnesses. But verse 39 through 44, the Holy Scriptures. Search the scriptures. You see this? For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from man, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in your own name, him you will receive. How can you believe 
which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God. My, that's a, a, a great sermon in itself, but look at the word search. The word search implies a diligently seeking or examination or an inspection of something. It means to probe. It means to investigate. And listen, these Jewish leaders were good at memorizing the scripture, reading the scripture, and talking about the scripture. They knew the scripture, and if they knew the scripture, they should have known that the scriptures were speaking of Christ. Amen? No, but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. He said, if you search the scriptures, and the scriptures then were referring to the works of Moses and the prophets and all the, their forefathers that they really exalted and honored. And Jesus said, if you would search those scriptures, those scriptures would testify on me. So there's your other witness, the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures. Then look at verse 45 through 46. We see witness number six, and that is Moses. It says here, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now to the Jews listening to this, this was something that in their thought was unpardonable. They could not handle this. Jesus was blaspheming above blasphemy when he says, Moses spoke of me. And you see, Moses did speak of Jesus Christ. Moses did exalt Jesus Christ. And again, had they been familiar with the teachings of Moses, they would have understood that their exalted leader, Moses, spoke, spoke of one higher than him, and that was of Jesus Christ. The, the Jewish leader would not would be condemned because they had not listened to or believed in the witness of Moses. See, God had given to Moses his word. God had preserved his word. And now God was interpreting his word, if, it, if you were, through the very life and teaching and, and message of Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus is saying, God the Father has given you everything that is necessary for salvation. Had you searched the scriptures and also noticed what Moses said of me, you could be saved. But you give more attention and you exalt common man and your own leaders more than you exalt Jesus Christ or the prophets of God. Because had you believed Moses, one of my prophets, had you believed him, you would certainly have believed in me. Then look at witness 7 in verse 47. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Now he's talking specifically about the words that Christ taught them. See? Love one another as I have loved you. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. If your brother sins against you, forgive him. On and on and on, those beautiful, wonderful, powerful words of Christ. And when he preached, he was not preaching himself, for his own glory and honor, he was preaching for the salvation of man's soul. I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. These are the wonderful words of Christ, the seventh witness that he gives of himself. And they did not hear him. It's amazing to me that the people that so profess to believe the Bible as the Word of God want to continue to tamper with its contents. You can go out into the community and you can talk to people. And it's just like some of these now banning some of these Bible versions because they speak of hell, because they speak of sodomites, because they speak of all these things that today are so offensive to so many people, so we'll just ban it. The problem is preachers did that long ago. Preachers would stand in God's holy pulpit and proclaim words and then get up and throw doubt upon the very teachings that they were preaching. We must believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. 
We must not add anything to it or take anything away from it. And we must preach it clear and let it speak for itself. And Jesus said, hey, if you deny my words, then uh, there is really no hope for you. It's a sad and pathetic thing. But in that, Jesus silences these accusers. You'll see now we enter into chapter 6. There's another story that's about to unfold. But in this part here, it's as if everything was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. Because they had nothing else they could say. And they were either burning in their face so mad that they couldn't stand Jesus, even worse, or they were growing in conviction in their own heart. Now you may know that many of the Pharisees and many of the Jewish leaders later did believe in Jesus. But initially in these kind of settings here, they could not stand him because it went against everything they taught and had been teaching the people to believe in. So when we read the word of God and no one can really read the Bible and study the Bible or search the Bible and not come away with the fact that Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus is God. He healed the impotent man on Sabbath. He did that because he was God. He made claims that he and the Father were the same, making himself equal with God because he is equal with God. And we see the tragedy here of the Jewish people or anyone even today rejecting Jesus Christ. Back then, they scorned him. They mocked him. They rejected him. They planned and plotted his assassination. And then eventually they crucified him. But the Bible tells us that we are living in a day when people will do some of the same thing. People today will mock Jesus. They will scorn Jesus. They will reject Jesus. And they will hate all of those who accept Jesus. But we all need to ask, what are we going to do with him? Will we receive him and accept what he's taught us? Will we be part of that group that tries to find some way to deny him? I trust that everyone here today truly believes. Now, can I get a witness? Yes, yes. sir. Please stand, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If we go to the Lord in prayer, it's important.